I wasn't nervous until I seen like people walking in here, and then it was like, what? So, um, I'm just gonna kind of share about Hezekiah because I love the Old Testament, and um, I love Hezekiah's heart. Um, I was looking up some facts about Hezekiah and and one thing I read was talking about Hezekiah and another king I didn't write it down it started with a J um, how God was well pleased with them maybe y'all know might know what it is but I don't know but um, so I'm gonna start in Isaiah 31 just so we can kind of get some backdrop uh, I also seen where Hezekiah's name meant the Lord is my strength, which I thought was really cool. Uh, when Israel split into two separate nations, Israel and Judah, neither one of the countries actually followed God. And there was a lot of Assyrians around, and the Assyrians were a very evil, evil people. You know, uh, they just did some horrific things. And I think we can probably relate to that, uh, to some of the stuff we see going on in our society today, because there's, there's just some stuff that's really, really evil. Um, so in Isaiah 31, um, it says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, and they rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many. And in horsemen, because they are very strong. But who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord? Yet he is also wise and will bring disaster and will not call back his words, but will arise again, but will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both who he helps will fall and he who is helped will fall down. They will perish together. So, um, and that's talking about, you know, not, not trusting in God and following in your own ways and your own strength and not God's strength. Um, God is the Lord of hosts. And he does defend Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Um, in verse 4 it says, For thus the Lord has spoken to me, as a lion roars, and a young lion over his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor be disrupted by their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. Like birds flying about, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver it. Passing over, he will preserve it. And then we're going to skip over to, uh, if, well, I'm probably not going to read all these because I have so many, but in Isaiah 32, it starts talking about Hezekiah and um, complacency. And... Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. A man will be a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. The eyes of those who will not see dim, and the ears of those who will hear will not listen, and also the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammers will be ready to speak plainly. The foolish person will no longer be called generous, nor the miser said to be bountiful. For the foolish person will speak foolishness, and his heart will work iniquity the practice, to practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord, to keep the hungry unsatisfied, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fall. And also the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaks justice. But a generous man gives generous things, and by generosity he shall 
st shall stand. Rise up, you women who are at ease. And this is where he talks about complacency. Hear my voice. You complacent daughters, give ear to my speech. In a year and some days, you will be troubled, you complacent women. For the vintage will fail, the gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves and make yourselves bare and gird sackcloth around your waist. So there are times of peace and there are times of happiness. Um, there are times of trouble, but yet comfort and blessings in the end. Uh, the difference would be not following God and following God. Okay. I can't, I can't do this like this. Okay, so I'm just going to speak from my heart, okay? Hezekiah, I love Hezekiah. I love Hezekiah's heart because Hezekiah um, had, he was just a normal man. He was just a normal guy. And David was just a normal guy. And um, a lot of the other people, just like us, they're just normal people, you know, that, that, that God uses. So God looks for certain hearts that he can use. Hezekiah's heart was, um, it was just for God. He knew he had had enough stuff happen in his life. He knew that he could rely on God, that he could trust God, that he could put everything he had in, into him. He could put his whole heart into him and that God would take care of him. So at, at one point, um, Hezekiah had been king for I don't know how long, but and then and then he gets word about this Assyrian army, which is like evil people. They have already ripped through all kinds. You know, Hezekiah is in Jerusalem. God says he will protect Jerusalem. So um, the Assyrians were going all around, and they were just like tearing up, ripping up, just going through and just overtaking all of these places. And so somebody sends word to Hezekiah and threw a letter and it was like, hey, I guess they're coming. You know, I hate to tell you this, but they're coming and they're coming for you. They've done to siege over everything else and they're, they're coming for you. And Hezekiah's heart, because he'd been through so much stuff in his life, was he took the letter and he went off somewhere, maybe it was a room, it probably says in there, I don't know, I'm nervous, I can't think about it, so, um, but he took the letter, and he went off somewhere, and he, and he went before the Lord, and he just laid, he laid the letter out on the floor, and he was like, God, I already done heard what he, they've been doing to all these people around here, and this letter says they're coming here, they're coming for Jerusalem, but I know who you are, so, here, I'm just going to lay this out before you. And, you know, however it works out, it works out. Because you're the one in control. Now, I'm obviously paraphrasing all that. Because I'm pretty sure they didn't talk like it then. But. <laughs> which, which is why I don't like teaching, because I don't talk very well. But, uh, So, in Isaiah 36, the bad news comes. Here comes trouble. Y'all ever had trouble come in your life? Yeah. Eh, I've never had any. Pinocchio. <laughs> uh, Isaiah 37 is where uh, Isaiah, uh, Hezekiah seeks God. And... The backstory of that is actually in 2 Kings. So if you've never read this story about Hezekiah, I highly encourage you to go to uh, 2 Kings and read it because it is such a good story. Um, in 2 Kings verse 18, uh, no, verse 12, uh, it lists the reason why God was allowing the truth the trouble in the first place. It 
And it said, oh, it's the wrong one. It says, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded, and they would neither hear nor do them. Now, y'all have to, y'all have to know that Jesus wasn't alive here yet. <laughs> you know, he didn't come yet. And so they had to do everything they had to do, they had to do by the book of the law, uh, which is, you know, the Ten Commandments. Uh, and so he gave specific instructions, and that's one of the reasons why I like the Old Testament so much is because he gives so much detail. God is so in to the details. If you go back and read about the details of the tabernacle, they are phenomenal because he talks about every little tiny thing. And so you have to know that if he cares that much about that much detail about the temple, that he cares that much about the detail in your life. Uh, so, and then in verse 13, it says, And in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, and I don't know how to pronounce that, Sennacherib King, we'll just call him S. King, okay? S. King of Assyria, he's the king of Assyria, the evil people, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, <clears throat> saying, I have, done, I have done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. And the king of Assyria assessed Hezekiah, the king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord in the treasures of the king's house. And at that time... Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And right there, he messed up. Because, see, he's human. He, you know, he, we all are human. We all mess up sometimes, you know. We know that we can read this word and I can read you scriptures all day long and we know that that's what we're supposed to do. But it doesn't always work that way, especially when trouble comes. So um, Hezekiah is human. He, he actually followed what was familiar. Sadly, he actually followed the example of his father because his father uh, was Ahaz. And if you go back in 2 Kings in, in 16, that's what Ahaz did. He followed idols. An idol is not necessarily a statue that's in front of you. You know, it's anything that you put before God. It could be your husband. It could be your kids. It could be, it could be your job. It could be sports. It could be anything that you put before the Lord. It could be anger. It could be unforgiveness, you know. Um, and so uh, he actually followed after his father was Ahab, Ahaz. But, you know, isn't that what we do a lot of times? Because uh, we follow what's familiar to us, what we know, you know. So um, before Jesus found me, you know, I did all of the, the things I wasn't supposed to do to, um, as self-defense mechanisms to kind of take care of myself so I could survive. And then when I found Jesus, at, you know, in uh, October 31st of 1999, the day I will never forget, because um, he radically changed me uh, on that altar right there. I think it was in a different place over there, but it was <laughs> definitely that altar. Um, you know, at that point, I, I had to start learning to do something different. So um, I had to start learning to do something that's not familiar to me, you know. Um, and then in verse 17 through 37 is when he gets the letter. So here comes trouble. Um, and then in 2 Kings 19, Hezekiah uh, sought God and I and it I'm just going to read this yeah because I want to get to this verse and so it was when King Hez, Hez, Hezekiah 
heard it, that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord, because he had just got the letter. And then he sent Elakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. Now, I want y'all to remember that because we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, It may be that the Lord, your God, will hear all the words of Rebesha, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words of which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer to the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah Isaiah was a prophet, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall, sh- thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, which with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon them, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to buy, to fall by the sword in his own land. Then uh, the, guy that, the, the guy that went returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he heard that he had departed from Lashix. And the king heard Tyra... King of Ethiopia, look, he has come out to make war with you. So again, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the king of Assyria has done to all the lands by utterly destroying them, and you shall be delivered, question mark. So he's kind of like, really? Have the gods of the nation delivered, have the gods of the nation delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed and the people of Eden who were in Telslar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Hena and Iva. So this is the king of Assyria saying all this stuff. He's like, I done took all these people out. And you really think the Lord your God's going to deliver you? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and he spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherub You are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of the S, which he has sent to reproach of the living God. Truly, Lord, the king of Assyria has laid waste of all of the nations and their land and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all kingdoms of the earth may know that you are Lord God and you alone. And that's his heart right there. He didn't, he didn't want to be delivered so that his kingdom would be okay and his people would not be like utterly destroyed. He wanted to be delivered so that everybody around would know who the creator of the universe was. Man, if we could have a heart like that. Because see, everything in this life is is not about us. It's about eternity things. It's about kingdom things. There's always going to be trouble. There's always going to be some bad news coming. 
everything is not going to be great. And I have learned in the last 22 years, especially if you follow God. Everybody says, you know, oh, follow God and it'll be great. And that's a lie. It, it is. It is great because you do follow him and, and you walk with him and you learn and you grow. Uh, so I've been doing this for 22 years. My first 30 years was, was horrific. And these 22 years have been really, really, really rough. But they have been really, really, really the best of my entire life because he walks with me he's he's always there it's awesome i love jesus in case y'all can't tell uh so so that was his heart um and then verse 19 so that the so that they may know that you are the lord god and you have to know to every physical there is a spiritual see Actually, Hezekiah got the letter, and so he had to physically put it on the ground. That was the physical part. You know, sometimes uh, we have to take action or do something. And to every physical, there's a spiritual. Now, the spiritual part was, you know, he wanted them to know that he was the creator of the universe. Um so to every physical, there's a spiritual. Physical action was to spread it before the Lord. And the spiritual is verse 6 and 7. The spiritual is what Isaiah the prophet said. And he said, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus the words of the Lord. Do not be afraid of the words of which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, which is the king of Assyria. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Only, I mean... That's the spiritual. That's something only God can do is to make the king of Assyria who is wiping all these people out, you know, have, have the... You got it. Um, and then in verse um, 20, God answers through Isaiah. Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against S. king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. And then, and then he, he, he goes on for... A lot talking about the stuff he's going to do, but so after all this, it's a couple of years after this. So this is like you know another big thing in Hezekiah's walk. And after after all of this, he he gets sick, you know. And 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 Isaiah the prophet comes back to him, and he's he said, "Well, I'm just going to read it." In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos went to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now, what would y'all do? I mean, seriously, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be like, you know, the bad news coming if, if, if I went to the doctor and they said, you know, you, you have X thing and you're not going to make it, you know? That, to me, that would be one thing because it's like, wow, you know, the doctor said this, and so I probably need to get some things in order, you know, so my husband doesn't have to take care of things. But if you get a word from a prophet that came from the Lord that says, set your house in order because you, you ain't going to make it. But look what Hezekiah did. See, this is why I love his heart so much. Uh, then he turned his face toward the wall, and he prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, 
I have walked before you in truth with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly, and it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle of the court. So Isaiah comes, and he tells him this news. Isaiah turns around on the wall. I mean, Hezekiah turns around on the wall. Isaiah goes back out, and before he gets to the middle, the Lord heard him again, not because he was like, you know, this great great king or anything is because of his heart his heart was for the Lord and not nothing else at all uh, and so before he goes out to the middle of the court the word of the Lord came to him saying return and tell Hezekiah the leader of my people thus says the Lord the God of David your father I have heard your prayer I have seen your tears and surely I will heal you on the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake, for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. So he took it and he laid it on the bowl, and then he recovered. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What is the sign that the Lord will heal me? And shall I go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? So he was like, Okay, I, I know he said this, but I don't, how am I going to know? What, am I supposed to do something? And then Isaiah said, This is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees? So he's asking him. So back then they had, you know, these, you had from the sun, the shadow would hit it, you know. And so he, he asked him, he said, do you want it to go forward 10 degrees or do you want it to go back 10 degrees? And again, this is his heart. And Hezekiah answered and said, it's an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. Because, I mean, that's the way the sun's going to go. Uh, but no, let the shadow go backwards 10 degrees again not anything that could have done it unless God did it so Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord and brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz uh, at that time well, actually, I'm going to skip to verse 14. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, well, no, I don't need to skip that. Sorry. Go back to verse 12. At that time, so this is a little while later, uh, something, the son of somebody, the king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah was attentive to them and showed them all the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all his armory. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to the king Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say to you and from where did they come? So Hezekiah said, They came from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered and said, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left. And then they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you. And they shall take away eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, for he said, Will there not be truth, at least in my days? So he, he just got word that he was going to be sick. He cried. He asked the Lord. The Lord said he would give him 15 more years. 
And then he goes and he's showing, he's showing off his, I guess you could maybe say it's idols. I don't know. But, you know, he's showing off some of the, some of the stuff in his house. And Isaiah comes to him and he's like, what are you doing? You know, because I, I, when I read this, I don't know. I'm not a Bible scholar, but I kind of think he, he went back to familiar, familiar things, you know. The, the guy seen him was sick. He sent him a gift, and he was like, oh, come, 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 look what I got. <laughs> you know, going, going back to the familiarity of it, of his stuff. And so then Isaiah comes in and was like, man, what are you doing? And Hezekiah says, well, I just, you know, I just showed it to him. And he said, and then Isaiah says, uh, you know, tells him all this stuff that's going to happen. And he's like, okay, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. His heart. He said, the word is good. The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. That's what he said. I don't know. Uh, to have a heart like that, you know. You see, you can't have a heart like that without having a relationship like that. I know Becca. I mean, I've been knowing you for about 22 years. How old are you? Okay, I've been knowing you for 20 years, right? So I, I know you. Do, do we ever hang out together? Not really, no. Do you know my favorite color? Do I know yours? Yeah, so I mean, we have a relationship. We, we come here in this building, we dance together, you know, we do be in together sometimes, you know. But I don't, well, I do know your heart because I know you, but you know what I mean? But it, it's, we don't always know somebody's heart, you know, um, because it's a relationship thing. So I love Jesus, but I do not like religion at all. I do not. Uh, it's not about religion, they have this little saying. It's not about religion, it's about the relationship, you know. And it's the, right, this, the relationship that Hezekiah had with the creator of the universe, you know. That's the kind of relationship that we need to have with him. Are we always going to get it right? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, because we are human. But his heart uh, was... To worship, and to worship is to have a relationship. So I'm a big person on definitions, too. I love definitions. So I looked up the definition of worship. Um, worship is more fully understood as an interrelation between divine action and human response. Is that physical? And spiritual stuff, you know, to every physical, there's a spiritual. Um, worship is more fully understand as an interrelation between divine action and a human response. Worship is the human response to self-revelation of the, I don't know what that word is, the self-revelation of God. The inc this includes divine initiation initiation in which God reveals himself his purposes his will a spiritual and personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ on the part of the worshiper and a response by the worshiper of adoration humility submission and obedience to God so when we do mess up we need to make sure you know, that we acknowledge that and, and be humble. It's okay to say, I messed up. It's okay to say, I didn't get this right. It's okay to say, I should have done this, but I done that. It's okay to get down on the floor and cry and cry out to God or on a wall or whatever and say, Lord, you know, it's okay to do that uh, because you should be able to have that kind of relationship. Um. 
Worship may be understood in either a broad or narrow context. In a broad sense, worship is seen as a way of life. And if y'all know me, y'all know I'm a worshiper. And that is definitely, that's just what I do. That's just, it's just ingrained in me. He put that in me. It's not something that I had. Um, uh, Worship is also pictured as an act of assembled people of God as seen in the worship prescribed by God in the tabernacle. So, you know, let's go into church. We should be doing that. Um, As well as the worship in the New Testament in, um, you know, where the Holy Spirit come come on them in Acts. That's worship too. In addition to the various congregational descriptions, worship sometimes involves individual encounters with God. Y'all ever had an encounter with God? I had one that day up on the altar. I don't. I couldn't tell you what happened. All I know is I went up there, and when I got up, I was totally different. I could see color for the first time. He tells the same thing, and his, you know, his story is way different than mine. But he says the same thing, you know. So, if you've never had an encounter, I encourage you to ask for one. Um, and uh, individual encounters with God. It's family worship, and includes a few descriptions of worship in heaven such as in Isaiah Revelation Um, the concept of the divine initiation of worship is seen in biblical texts it is apparent that God enjoyed communion with Adam his newly formed creature the Bible says that the Lord created man to bring glory to God that's in Isaiah and man's refusal refusal to function in this capacity is seen by the Apostle Paul as a fundamental offense against the Creator. That's in Romans, first chapter of Romans. God demonstrated initiative in his worship relationship with Israel when he commanded Moses, they are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. In the tabernacle instructions, God prescribes a sacred space, a holy place, a sacred time, the Sabbath, and his desire to dwell among his people. God promised to be present with his people, that's in Exodus, and to reveal to them his glory. The Lord continued this relationship with Israel in the temple worship. I said all that to get to this. Similar concepts emerge in the New Testament. Divine initiative is seen in Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman in John 4. There, Jesus states that God is seeking true worshipers, worshipers, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. In this passage, Jesus teaches that genuine worship is no longer confined to a particular place, but is based upon a spiritual relationship between the worshiper and God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's deep. Uh, Hezekiah does not pray, Lord, spare me, but Lord, remember me. Whether I live or die, let me be yours. Man, to have a heart like that. God, always hear the prayers of a broken heart. So if you're broken, you're in a good place. I know I don't feel like it, but you're in a good place because God is very attentive to that. You know, I've I've always been a really weird person, so um, there there may be some things going on with uh, where somebody did something wrong and it's like the whole world is like, railing against that person you know because they, they shouldn't have done this and and I feel so bad for them because they have so much stuff coming against them surely they already know that they did wrong maybe not maybe they're just evil people like the Assyrians you know but I feel like man if they could if they could have one person be faithful enough to just pray for them you know I don't know. Like I said, I'm weird. So, God always hears the prayers of the brokenhearted. Uh, We did the worship definition. Hezekiah had such a relationship with God out of that relationship birthed 
faith. Uh, I told y'all we were going to go back over here. And then they said to him, thus says Hezekiah the king, this is the day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. Okay, so if a woman has a baby, the baby comes out and the baby is new, right? Um, so t to birth something is to have something new. So it's not to do the familiar anymore, it's to do something new. Uh, to do something new, you have to be willing to grow. Babies have to grow. They ha you have to be teachable. Because, you know, we need to teach the, the babies. The babies don't, don't just be like at two years old. No, don't teach me. I don't want to learn. You know, well, some of them maybe. But, but they have to be teachable. They have to be nurtured. Um, and, you know, and when it says, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth, you know, what? Where where is our where is our heart to help that process? You know. Uh, I don't know what else. I think maybe do that do that thing, but you know. Yeah, well, you have to play them both back to back. It's only like five minutes, but this is a, a thing I've heard many, many, many years ago by T.D. Jakes, you know. I know, you know. But um, I don't know. This has just always resonated in my spirit, you know, because if we could have a heart like Hezekiah's where that we know that we know that we know that he is the creator of the universe and whatever he has planned for us is okay. Good. See, in case you don't understand, God, if, 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 if it were possible for God to have a weakness, it would be for worship. <laughs> he loves a worshiper. The omniscient, omniscient, all seeing, all knowing God said, I seek a worshiper. I look for a worshiper. God loves worshipers so much so that when Hezekiah's time had come to die and Isaiah the prophet had come to execute a judgment on him and to pronounce rather a judgment on his life, Hezekiah began to talk about all the works that he had done, but the sentence was still decreed. Hezekiah began to talk about how he kept the law, but the death sentence was still in force. Finally, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and said, Lord, the grave cannot praise you. And God said, if you're going to praise me, I'll add 15 years to your life. He told Isaiah, go back and tell Hezekiah, if he's going to praise me, I'll restore him. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but if you really start worshiping God correctly, he'll restore you. You see, let me tell you, half of the things that pass for worship are not really worship in the church. Because if real worship hits the church, the musicians can't play, the ushers can't usher, the deacons can't be deacons. I mean, if real Holy Ghost worship hits the place, I'm not talking about that stuff you do because the camera's on you, but I'm talking about something that you do out of your belly, out of your heart, out of your spirit, because he brought you from a mighty long way, and you love him with all of your mind. Let me explain the difference between praise and worship. Anybody can praise God. In fact, everybody ought to praise God. The Bible said, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Anybody can praise him because when you praise God, you start praising the Lord. I thank you for giving me my shoes. I thank you for giving me my suit. I thank you for how you gave me my job. I thank you for how you blessed me with this car. I thank you for how you brought me through college. and I thank you for how you're helping my career. 
all of that is praise. Praise thanks God for what he did. Let me show you the difference between praise and worship. The praise is thanking God for his shoes. The worshiper says, if I don't have no shoes, if I don't have no car, if I don't have any house, if I never get anything, I, pray, I worship you for who you are. I worship you because you're God. You don't have to perform. You don't have to impress me. You don't have to play Santa Claus. But just because you're God, you mean so much to me. I'll tear up my face and cry. I'll mess up my makeup and cry. I'll shake down my hair and cry. Oh, you're so valuable. Your presence is valuable. Your love is valuable. Your peace is valuable. I just want to be alone.